Thank you very much. It's a big pleasure and honor to take part in this uh, conference. I'm probably one of the few people which is not directly related to oncology or hematology. Uh, but um, uh, I must admit that uh, over the last decade, gastroenterologists as, as a society have been uh, pretty much skeptical about cell therapies uh, because there has been a lot of fundamental research in the area with very few or almost no clinical application and um, everyone was uh, a little bit uh, put back in, in this field. However, we have good news and I'll, I'll try to go briefly through some of the emerging therapies in the field. So I'll, I'll talk uh, what you also already heard today about the cell therapies in, in inflammatory bowel disease, uh, uh, what we have in the refractory con Crohn's disease and also in the fistulizing Crohn's disease. I'll also mention a few words on uh, microbes as a cell therapy to reboot our immunity and uh, there'll be a couple of slides on cell therapies uh, that are uh, emerging in, in liver diseases. So uh, those who work in uh, university hospitals are very well aware of uh, the inflammatory bowel diseases and the numbers of patients with these two diseases, uh, mainly Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, is uh, growing every year, so most of the patients are young and they're really suffering from the uh, severe diarrhea pain uh, in, in if they get these diseases and uh, of course we have um, really much better options to treatment but still a lot of challenges remain. So uh, if we look in the incidence of these diseases, so the lithium is here and it's depicted in blue, it's uh, some data coming from our uh, epidemiological study which has been going on for many years. So the situation is in Lithuania is, is very good. We have few patients with these diseases in comparison to Western countries. But what we see that the number of, of uh, new incident cases of Crohn's and uh, ulcerative colitis in Lithuania is growing yearly. Uh, and this is probably related to the lifestyle which is changing and, and catching up with the Western style over the last decade. Uh, so, um, if we look at the IBD historically, of course, the, the major breakthrough was the application of steroids and we have other therapies as, such as 5-ISA and uh, azotriaprine available. Of course, a huge change was uh, anti-TNF introduction and there are also some new molecules in the market, but also hematopoietic stem cell transplantation has been uh, attempted and is, is still a treatment option, I believe, in, in some of these patients. So. Uh, as you heard already today several uh, times, this uh, has emerged as a uh, treatment option for various autoimmune disorders and uh, first attempts to use this uh, stem cell therapy in IBD date back to the early 90s. So there are many successful case reports uh, using this approach, uh, however, uh, quite a lot of uh, concern about adverse events and there is also concern about the long-term efficacy. Uh, and also further claims for additional evidence. So this was a slide that you probably already saw today from uh, Professor Snowden's presentation. So this is a very nice uh, review which shows all the uh, stem cell transplantation patients that uh, have uh, undergone this procedure with refractory Crohn's disease. So there has been a boost uh, some uh, seven, eight years ago, how the number of procedures has declined uh, since then. Uh, one of the reasons probably is uh, uh, somewhat negative results of the ASTIC trials. You see those blue uh, columns here which represent the patients which have been included in this trial. Uh, but uh, also what happened in the last uh, five years, there has been a, a number of new molecules which became available for these patients. Uh, therefore, uh, many of the patients which came on clinical trials uh, started receiving the other medications as well. So if we look at this ASTIC trial which was conducted in 11 uh, centers, so I don't have the, the, the full flow chart, but uh, in the end of this trial 45 patients were randomized and 23 of them received uh, stem cell transplantation and the other group of patients uh, received standard therapy. Uh, so there's uh, more than 20 patients in each arm and um, uh, overall the findings of this trial have been reported as negative. So the, if you compared the sustained disease remission uh, in the two groups, the, there was no significant differences and there was also no difference in the disease activity index. So uh, if we look at the numerical values, 
uh, so no active disease uh, or uh, Crohn's disease activity index and free of active disease. So the, all of these numbers are better in a hemopoietic stem cell transplantation group than compared to controls. So the major issue in this trial was that uh, um, in, in the cell transplant group there were a lot of uh, serious adverse events in, uh, in comparison with the control group and this was uh, one of the major obstacles to uh, put more enthusiasm in, in, in uh, this uh, uh, clinical management protocol. So, but in order uh, not to completely, I think, eradicate uh, this uh, treatment option from these patients, uh, there was a very uh, smart um, uh, agreement uh, between European Crohn's and Colitis Organization and the European Society of Bone and Marrow Transplantation, where we published a report uh, this year, uh, kind of a consensus that we should not uh, make uh, final decisions based just on one clinical trial. And of course, they suggested to use alternative uh, uh, um, um, alternate treatment options in order to reduce the burden of toxicity that was reported in this trial. And uh, further trials are now heavily encouraged in the field as well. Uh, so this ASTIC trial has also been uh, revisited and, and basically what it found that uh, in the end uh, there were some uh, clinical uh, markers which uh, identified those patients who would, who would uh, most likely not benefit from this uh, therapy. So smoking and perianal disease uh, in, 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 in uh, this trial were associated with uh, serious adverse events. So probably those patients are not the best candidates for hemopoietic stem cell transplantation with Crohn's disease. Uh, but uh, of course we need uh, to identify um, another uh, molecular probably markers uh, to identify those patients who could really benefit from this therapy. Because if we look um, at many case reports and some case series in, uh, on Crohn's disease, uh, this, this uh, treatment approach, there are really success stories and there are patients who are absolutely disease free for uh, quite a long period of time. So this is something which uh, probably needs not to be forgotten and, and uh, reanalyzed in uh, additional further studies. So, of course, we need further uh, randomized studies in this field and, uh, uh, of course, those biomarkers uh, that uh, would help us to predict those patients who could respond uh, to uh, these uh, procedures are uh, very, very uh, important. You're probably, those who work in this field are more, much more well aware than I am of those uh, biomarkers uh, provided by next generation sequencing and other met methodologies that can help us to uh, really identify those patients who really can reset their immunity. So, uh, but the, the really good news came uh, out just uh, recently and they were presented in our latest gastroenterology meeting. So, when we have a, a Crohn's disease, the, the, the worst form of Crohn's disease is, is when you have fistulizing form. And then, uh, of course, with anti-TNF therapy, you can treat some of those fistula. But uh, we all have patients who really have refractory fistula and they do not respond to conventional therapies. And uh, usually those patients are young and uh, having a fistula, especially in the perineal region, really impairs their quality of life. So what um, uh, has been done over the last um, 10 years, there have been attempts to uh, treat fistula with uh, various uh, cell preparations However, none of them have been really brought to this uh, clinical application level. But uh, the recent uh, publication in gastroenterology is it's a phase three uh, randomized control trial uh, showed that uh, this drug, which has this CX601 uh, code, and it also has uh, a new name, which I still haven't uh, learned, is, is uh, effective in treatment of perennial uh, fistula with Crohn's disease. So if, if you compare the patients who received this uh, cell therapy uh, to the standard care of arm, there you see a, a significant uh, improval. And if you can heal 50% of patients with um, uh, refractory fistula by this method, which is really, really a huge uh, advance in the field. And uh, so uh, European Medical Association uh, just recently approved this product for use in, in, in Europe. And uh, uh, this makes this um, drug the first uh, allogenic stem cell therapy to receive this in, in Europe. And uh, we're really waiting uh, for this 
to come to Lithuania as well. The company which developed this is a small company based in, in Belgium, but they uh, collaborate now with Takeda and lot. And really, after this trial, the, the shears went uh, up a lot. So we are uh, looking forward uh, to trying this uh, medication in clinical practice. So basically, what uh, you do, you uh, through the uh, uh, through the help of endoscope or sometimes with the help of surgeon as well, you infuse these uh, cells into the fistula and it within one year it heals in 50% of patients. So that's uh, really much better than what we had before. And these uh, stem cells are adipose derived stem cells and that's uh, really um, the, the, the only clinical application that we have now in gastroenterology that is uh, probably will be reimbursed in, in, in Lithuania soon as well. So I just want to, to show a couple of slides and, uh, uh, and talk about microbiome. When we think about uh, uh, cell therapy, we always think about the human-derived cells, but we usually forget that uh, the largest number of cells within our body actually come from microbes. So with the next generation sequencing technologies, we know that each surface, each lumen is uh, full of bacteria and uh, uh, of course we got interested not only in reading those bacteria but now we have the potential to modify uh, microbiome and uh, maybe this uh, could help us in treating of some of the diseases. So this is uh, one of the studies which comes from our department published in, in GUT. So we try to uh, compare the microbiome in Germany, Lithuania and, and India and uh, I must say that uh, Lithuanian microbiome is, is, is uh, much better than uh, German microbiome because we have more diversity, but we are much worse than Indians, both of us, both Germans and Lithuanians. Because, and, and that's uh, probably, uh, there are many reasons for this, but uh, uh, this could be related to some of the complex diseases uh, that are pr present in our societies. If we look at the genetic predisposition in inflammatory bowel disease patients, so these are the results from uh, GIVA studies on uh, inflammatory bowel disease where we also took part a lot. So most of the genes which have been identified are linked with the bacterial recognition and with immunity. So. The, this pathway through bacteria to causing autoimmunity is, is becoming more and more clear and uh, uh, this is again one study from our department showing that patients with ulcerative colitis have much smaller diversity of gut microbiome than the healthy, uh, healthy individuals in, in Lithuania or in Germany. So this uh, approach has been brought to clinical trials and, and uh, the, uh, there is a study just published in Lancet where they used uh, fecal microbiome transplantation to treat refractory ulcerative colitis and um, uh, they uh, used uh, 40 patients in each arm. So patients who were in FMT group, they had a response uh, which was significantly higher than in the control group. So this is uh, something which uh, probably needs further uh, elaboration of course, but uh, we started performing FMTs uh, a couple of years ago and we, for recurrent Clostridium difficile infection, so we are probably one of the, uh, or I'm, I still think we are the only center doing this uh, um, in the Eastern Europe, so you get very good uh, response rates uh, and then we really help the patients. But uh, what I think is interesting for oncology and hematology, that uh, there are numerous studies now showing that hemopoietic stem cells transplantation induces shifts in gut microbiome. So this is, uh, so you, you reboot your immunity, you administer a lot of antibiotics in, in, in the acute setting and uh, your diversity really changes uh, over the time. So what's, uh, uh, what also happened uh, in the last years that there are some uh, small case series, they are very small, there they show that uh, using FMT, fecal microbial transplantation, in patients with resistant graft versus host disease, you can uh, get a, a remission or partial remission. So this is one, a very small paper pub published in, 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 in blood with, uh, where they treated by this approach four patients and they got a complete response in three and, and a partial response in one patient. And there are more small case series now published, but I think uh, we'll get the final answer uh, from a clinical trial which is now being done in Israel and it's registered in clinical trials of work so uh, we'll really really have a, uh, maybe a next indication in clinical practice for that and I heard from our colleagues that they're having very nice results in Italy at least on, on this approach. So uh, just 
very briefly, not to prolong my presentation about cell therapies in liver disease. So there have been attempts to uh, treat uh, congenital uh, disorders uh, with uh, gene-based deficiencies that uh, uh, are present in liver, as well as acquired uh, disorders with acute liver failure. However, um, to date, all of those attempts have not been so much successful. Uh, so most of the cells which are transfused in, in, in the liver, um, uh, they fail to survive in the long run. There are some successful case reports with, for treatment of some monogenic diseases, uh, but this is still not uh, widely used and, and widely available. So just uh, one uh, small trial which has been published recently, so they tried to infuse um, stem cells into the patients with liver cirrhosis and they expected uh, that there would be a regeneration and restoration of liver function. <coughs> uh, those slides show that basically the liver function and, and all the liver fibrosis rate remained the same uh, throughout the treatment. Nevertheless, uh, I think this, this is a huge uh, field which needs further exploration. When uh, last um, uh, study that I want to show, sorry, but this is just an abstract that was, was presented uh, uh, just uh, a month ago in, in a hepatology meeting. Uh, so basically with the CRISPR-Cas technology, now you have the ability to modify stem cells. And, and uh, here they, they took uh, stem cells from the patient with Wilson's disease and they basically show that you can uh, really correct those cells without making genetic errors. And this is, a, I think, a really, really a huge step forward, which will probably help uh, in the long run to treat some of the monogenic diseases. So, so to sum up, uh, the uh, autohemopoietic stem cell transplantation uh, still, I think, is an option for refractory IBD cases. But of course, we need uh, better strategies to select uh, the best candidates and of course to outweigh potential risk uh, against adverse events. So those local therapies for fistulizing Crohn's disease that I show is, is really a huge change and, and uh, they are really entering clinical practice now. Microbiome mediated reprogramming uh, holds a huge promise as in treatment of many diseases, not IBD, I believe, and of course specific liver targeted therapies are very well, very much welcomed by gastroenterologists in the long run. And, uh, to end my talk, I just want to use this opportunity to invite you to the international uh, workshop on uh, Helicobacter and Microbiota, which will be dedicated uh, for inflammation and cancer. So we'll look at these immunity immediately the processes uh, uh, this year in September in Kona. So I hope to see at least some of you there. And so thank you for your attention.